Talk of the Trollway spotlights Mount Horeb, Wisconsin's unique artists, entertainers, hobbyists, and personalities. Funding for Talk of the Trollway is provided by Miller & Sons Supermarket. Even after 40-some years, Larry Wheelow can still be surprised by the images he creates on his printing press. With a home in Mount Horeb and a studio in Blue Mounds, scenery from both communities often takes center stage in his etchings. However, by his own admission, he might need to pass by a subject several times before he gets that light bulb moment. Inspiration can also strike as he tours the nearby countryside or tinkers with what he calls the vocabulary of the medium. I'm your host Gary Schutz and on this episode of Talk of the Trollway, Larry explains the value of working directly with the subjects and the importance of experimentation. One thing I've realized is different people see different things in the story. I prefer that people read what they want into it, what makes it meaningful to them. And that's one of the beauties of visual art. It's a wordless medium. It's a very sort of intimate interaction between the viewer and the piece of artwork. The traditional material is copper and I take a flat smooth sheet of copper and I put a paint on it which is actually a protective coating onto the plate, onto the copper sheet. Once that coating dries I take a tool called an etching needle which is basically a stylus. When I do an etching I do, a, do them a little different from most artists. What I like to do is take my plate to wherever my subject is and, and be there with the subject in front of me and draw onto the plate while I'm observing the subject. When I'm drawing on the plate, I'm just scratching through the black coating that's on the copper. After I've completed my drawing, I come back to the studio where I take the plate and I put it into an acid. The coating on the plate protects the metal from the acid, but everywhere that I've scratched a line, the acid is able to get at the metal and etch it or dissolve it. So I take the plate out, I remove the coating, it comes off with mineral spirits, then I'm ready to pull a print. I take the plate and I cover it with my printing ink. I wipe the ink off the surface of the plate. The ink remains in all the grooves. I then take the plate to my etching press and set it on the press bed. I lay a sheet of dampened etching paper on top of the plate. The press itself is, is like a ringer washer. The bed moves between the two rollers of the ringer. I turn the wheel of the press. Everything goes between the two rollers, which put out a tremendous amount of pressure. The pressure is so great that it will force the paper into all of the contours on the plate where it will go down into the grooves and pick up the ink. Many of the etchings that I do, they're very straightforward in my printing. Uh, I'll apply the ink, I'll wipe the plates, um, and then run it through the press. But there is also a large number of my etchings where I manipulate the ink on the surface. Etching is really a pretty unique printmaking process in that, um, and I ad admire, you know, relief prints, woodcuts, uh, serographs, lithographs, um, but with those processes, you roll the ink on and you run it through the press. With etchings, you can manip you, you're wiping the plate with your hands and you're manipulating the ink and you can emphasize, emphasize different aspects of your image. That's something that I 
do quite a bit. If you look at one of my etchings from the very first prints to the very last prints in the edition, you'll see a definite evolution. The best analogy I can think of is like playing a piece of music. Say you're a pianist and um, you're playing a piece of music for the first time and it will come off a certain way. You may play it just perfectly according to the notation, but um, as, you, as you play it more, you become more um, adept at it, more, you know, you'll, you'll see more things and maybe bring out more things. I have a pretty good idea of what something will look like when I take it out of the acid, but, you know, when I'm drawing on the plate, uh, I have a plate that is black and I'm scratching through this black coating and um, what I'm seeing is light lines against a black surface. After this is etched and printed, I'll then have, wherever I had a light line, it will be a black line against a light surface. Not only that, but it will be um, reversed from what you were drawing on the plate. So uh, I, I have a reasonably good idea of what I'm getting, but um, you know, there it, it's never, you, you have an idea of what you want the finished pro product to look like. But there are always a series of steps that you go through to, to achieve that. And it's partially just working, working within the medium. The way I see it is um, etching and printmaking is a vocabulary. It's a language. And I want to use that language. And sometimes using that language, um, you know, what I described earlier was line etching and with the coating on the plate and the needle and putting it in the acid. But from the, that's how the earliest etchings were done. But since then, people have always tried to figure out other ways to do it, other ways to do the medium, and it has, if I were to do all of my etchings, the first etchings I did were line etchings only, and I still do a lot of line etchings and love doing them, but if that was all that I did, I think I'd be pretty bored. What I like to do is take the vocabulary of the medium and and use it. Each part of the vocabulary can be combined with the other parts. I can do a line etching one time, but then I'll think, well, what if I did sugar lift, which is another technique, and it's a technique usually used in combination with aqua tint, which is another technique. And what if I use, you know, do a sugar lift etching and not use aqua tint? What would that be like? And what if I do a, a sugar lift etching and do part of it without aqua tint and part of it with aqua tint? And, you know, so uh, there are many ways of combining things. It's never exactly what you um, expect. And, and the, the goal that I have is to maneuver that piece so it is within the range of what I expect. It's just a result of seeing things repeatedly. I ride my bike a lot between here and Mount Horeb, where I live, and Barneveld. That etching of the tree over there is a tree that I rode by hundreds of times. 
between here and Barneveld before I finally decided and found a spot where, you know, I could draw it from. When I was living in Minneapolis, I was participating in the Art Fair on the Square, and I did that for 25 years, and every July, the part that I would look forward to the most would be driving down East Wash towards the Capitol, and, you know, just the layers of depth that made an imprint, and, you know, finally two years ago, I hadn't done the Art Fair on the Square for 20 years, but I thought, I have to, I have to make that etching. I don't worry about things. I'm very accepting of how things turn out. I work things through stages, and I'll work through as many as 30 stages to finish one, one plate. And so oftentimes that takes place over a year or even more, even if I don't like something that I have done, I've learned how to make it work. I'm very good at setting things aside and going back to them later. There was a time when I first started where if I started working on an etching, I would be very obsessive about finishing that piece. And now I am just the opposite. I will fill shelves with projects that maybe have been sitting there for two years and I put them there in a state of great disappointment thinking that's the worst thing I ever did and then two years later I'll take it out and go, oh, okay, this is what I need to do. I think because I'm an artist I l look at it in terms of, you know, translating it onto a rectangular shape, but I think there are probably many more perceptive visual people. I mean, I can walk through my backyard with my wife and be pretty oblivious to all the flowers that have bloomed since the last time we were out there. It's how I perceive the process and my, um, my shifting to working directly from the subject has been a big step. For many years I did everything in the studio and I think my, my work has a, a, an energy to it that um, maybe it didn't have before. It's not a random sort of thing. It, I mean, I have done random things, but I think the best things that I do are ones that, you know, where they click. It just gets to a point where you can see how things will work. I decided that I was going to do this only with Aquatint and that I wasn't going to have any guidelines on it to, you know, show me where to put the shapes and so forth. And I had an idea of how I was going to do it, and I did it, and I struggled with it, and, you know, at times was maybe exasperated by it, but um, I stuck with it, and the print worked, and it achieved a certain amount of notoriety for me. It told me that it sort of affirmed my, my notion that, you know, you don't have to do these a certain way, that you can, if you think of a way to do them and you pursue it, it's, it's good. I've always been committed to drawing things that I would see every day. And I've lived in some very visually stimulating places. I mean, Northeast Iowa is gorgeous. I drew the landscape and the buildings that existed there. And same in Minneapolis and um, the same here. 
But I, I would say that things happened in my art since I moved here in 94 that um, pushed me. Now I'm more consistently producing what I would like to think of as being good art. I think the prints that I am doing now are the best prints that I've ever done. But I would have said that 10 years ago. I, I would have said that 20 years ago. And I, get, I think it's how I have to think. You know, you're always moving and hopefully progressing. I mean, it's, it's an unusual sort of profession, really, in that it's not like food or clothing and other things that people must have art. I mean, some people feel that way, um, but you know, it's uh, what I do is create the pieces and hopefully convince in some way people that. They need it. <laughs> Coming up on Talk of the Troll Way, it could be you or someone you know. Let us know who we haven't met yet. Email talktrollway at gmail.com. Talk of the Trollway is a production of Mount Horeb, Wisconsin's Village Cable Station, Trollway TV. Funding for Talk of the Trollway is provided by Miller & Sons Supermarket.